Let's continue with our last lecture for uh, this semester. We did a chapter on transient heat conduction, and then we did quite a few numbers, quite a few chapters on convection heat transfer. Firstly, the fundamentals, then external forced convection, then internal forced convection, natural convection. We skip boiling and condensation. That I will do with the next uh, module in the next semester. And we are now busy with the last chapter for this curriculum, which is on heat exchangers. We've covered the different types of heat exchangers, five different types. It's not all the different types which are available. We've discussed the overall heat transfer coefficient, not really in detail because we've done it already, but we've applied it on a few problems. And then I've introduced the effectiveness NTU method. Okay, we've looked quickly at the theory, some of the equations, uh, some of the figures where you can get the effectiveness from. And what we're going to do now is going to do two examples, okay, on the effectiveness NTU method. Okay, now the first example is going to be a heat exchanger, which is going to be a crazy one, okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's do something like that, <laughs> almost like a shell and tube heat exchanger, where, but we do something like that on the inside of the heat exchanger, where it's almost more than one shell. Uh, maybe I should do it like this. Okay, and let's even put in another one here, something like that, with lots of baffles. And there's uh, the inlet of the shell. And the inlet receives water vapor at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And the surface area for the heat transfer is going to be 0.5 square meters. I'll put in the other stream just now. The overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 2000 watts per square meter degree Celsius or Kelvin. Okay, the CP of the cold side, that would be for water, is 4179 joules per kilogram Kelvin. I'm going to give you that information just now. And the cold water inlet temperature is equal to 15 degrees Celsius. And the mass flow rate on the cold water side is equal to 0.5 kilograms per second. Okay, so we've got this water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius. And schematically, I'm just going to show it like this. Maybe it's going to flow through there. Maybe my sketch wasn't that good. Let's close it up there. Make an opening for it here. Okay. Force it to go maybe through there, something like that. Okay, and there it is going out. Okay, so that's the water vapor stream, the hot stream on the outside in the shell. So, in a sense, maybe you can say it as, sh as shell and tube, but I've changed this shell so that it doesn't even look like a shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay. So it is totally something different. <coughs> okay. And what we're going to do now is we're going to put in some water that is going to do the condensation. And let's put in the water here, the water tubes like this. And we do something like that. Okay, so if I can show it as the cold side. Where is it? Something like this. Okay, and the water is here. The cold water going in is at 15 degrees Celsius. Cold water inlet temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. Okay. And what we have to determine is the effectiveness of the heat exchanger, the outlet temperature of the water, 
the cold water side and the heat transfer rate. So those are the three things that we are asked to determine. Okay? <coughs> you understand the problem? You have a question? Anything that you don't understand? This is uh, water being condensed on the inside and on the outside is just water. Okay, so let me make it more clear. So in a TS diagram, okay, and again let's use the red again to indicate <laughs> it's the water vapor. Okay, so and it's at 100 degrees Celsius and we know that the pressure would then be 100 kPa okay, for the condensation process to occur. Okay. So if we look at the two streams, okay, if we look at the two streams, we have the water condensing. If it condenses, it means the temperature remains constant at 100 degrees Celsius. There's no change in temperature, except if your design is not very good and there's a significant pressure drop. Okay, so if there's a significant pressure drop, then maybe it could do something like that. But in general, the temperature would remain constant. Okay. And let's choose it just from left to right, it doesn't matter. Okay. Now let's put in the cold water stream. In the cold water stream, we always want to plot this or calculate the LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay. So if we do that, then the water inlet temperature must be 15 there. Okay. And we will have something like that. Okay. So in terms of the cold stream, there is the cold stream in terms of blue. Okay, are you happy with that? Right. Now if you don't know anything about the effectiveness NTU method, what would your approach be? Well, you would say, well, okay, we know that the heat transfer rate is equal to UA multiplied by a correction factor multiplied by LMTD. Okay. So, you have to calculate the LMTD. Okay. But can you calculate it? The answer is no. You can only do it if you have this outlet temperature. Okay. Can we get this outlet temperature? <laughs> we have the mass flow rate of the water, okay, 0.5, the inlet temperature, but we do not know how much heat transfer occurs. So therefore we cannot get the outlet temperature. So we do not have that and we do not have that. And that is the problem that you faced if you do not know any other method of calculating it. You can do it iteratively, so you can go and select something and you can work through the problem a few times. But that is why the effectiveness NTU method is so easy and uh, so easy to use okay, and convenient. Right. So in terms of the effectiveness NTU method, we would say that we would like to know what is the heat capacity on the hot side and the heat capacity on the cold side. Okay, the heat capacity is always equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp. Okay, and this would be for hot, for the hot side, and that would be for the cold side, the heat capacity ratio. And that tells us how much heat transfer must occur to change the temperature with one degree Celsius. Okay, how much heat transfer must occur for the temperature to remain to change with one degree Celsius. Okay. So if we look at the first one, the hot side, what happens with the hot side? We have condensation. The CP doesn't exist, okay? Because if you put in heat, the temperature doesn't change. Okay. So this C is the bigger one, it's infinite. Okay. This one is on the cold side, and we have the mass flow rate of the water 
It has been given as 0.5 and the CP as 4179. Okay. Now the CP obviously is an estimate. You can choose it to be at 15 degrees Celsius because you have this temperature. You do not have that one. But if you look at it, you can say, well, it can't be more than 100. So if you want to, you can use the average between 15 and 100, or you can just make your own selection and say, man, I don't think that outlet temperature is going to be more than 40. You can get the average and you can get a CP value to, to use. Okay, so the CP on the cold side would then be equal to 2090 watts per Kelvin. Now, small c it is just a convenient way of, of making the, the equations to be simpler. Small c is equal to c minimum divided by c maximum. Okay. In this case, c minimum would be which one? It would be this one, 2090. Okay. And c maximum would be the infinite one. Okay. So the small c equal to zero. Okay. Right, now we know that and we actually now want to go and calculate all these things. And we've heard about this method of the effectiveness into you method and now we can go to our textbook and Aaron, if you can zoom in there for us and there are four different types of heat exchangers. You see them? There's a double pipe one, there's a shell and tube one, there's a cross flow one, and then there's all heat exchangers with C equals zero. Okay. So in the fine print, what do you see in the fine print? In the fine print, you get the answer. But the three other heat exchangers is not this one that we're considering. That is why I've made it differently. It's not a shell and tube in this case. Okay. okay. But in the fine print, it says all heat exchangers with C equals zero. You see that? Or is it too small? Can I make it larger for you maybe? Uh, there you go. Uh, today I've got a better mouse. All right. So there it is. All heat exchanges with C equal zero. Then the effectiveness is equal to one minus E to the minus NTUs. Simplest of all equations. Okay. And the NTUs, how do you calculate it? There it is. The NTUs, it is given the number of transfer units is equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by C minimum, the smallest of the two. Okay, the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 2000. The surface area for the heat transfer is 0.5, C minimum is 2090, and that gives us a value of 0.4785. Right. What would your immediate reaction be if that is the into use? Okay. Okay. In terms of our experience, we've seen that if the into use becomes starts becoming 3 to 5, then the heat exchanger would be very effective. So these temperatures would start becoming very close to each other. Okay. It's only 0.4, so it's not really a good heat exchanger. Do okay. you agree? <laughs> it's not a good heat exchanger. Okay. So if we now calculate the effectiveness, it is e equal to 1 minus E to the minus NTUs, and the NTUs is equal to o minus 0.4785. Five, and from that we can calculate the effectiveness of as 0.38, so about 38 percent. Okay. 38 percent effectiveness. What does the effectiveness mean? The effectiveness means it is equal to the actual heat transfer divided by the maximum. The actual divided by the maximum. Okay, so what is the maximum heat transfer? Q max would be equal to, and we've done it yesterday, C minimum divided by 
the maximum possible temperature difference for this problem. And the maximum possible temperature difference would be those two. Okay, so that is delta T max. It is the difference between the inlet temperature of the cold stream and the inlet temperature of the hot stream. That is delta T max. So it is equal to TH in minus TC in. Okay. C minimum, and why C minimum? Because that's the stream that is going to move the most. Okay, for every kilowatt, it's going to have the largest increase in temperature or change in temperature. Okay, so, so in C minimum, we've worked out, is equal to 2090. The temperature difference, hot stream going in is 100, and the cold stream going in is 15. Right, so the result is equal to 1,177, 650 watt. Please, so that's not an engineering answer. Okay, so that is equal to 178 kilowatts. Okay. That would be the maximum that this heat exchanger can do. So if I've worked this out and I see this and I'm disappointed, I can now go back, and what can I do? I can change the surface area, so I can maybe make this tube longer. <laughs> I can change the overall heat transfer coefficient by changing one or both of the heat transfer coefficients. Increasing the mass flow rate, Prandtl number, or something like that. And that's all I can do, or I can change the CP value of one of the streams. Until, until this NTUs starts becoming 3 to 5. <laughs> Then the effectiveness would be very large, and then I will start getting close to the maximum possible heat transfer that can be done. Right, so now that we know that the effectiveness is equal to the heat transfer rate divided by Q max, we can now calculate the actual heat transfer rate. So the effectiveness is equal to 0.38, it's equal to the heat transfer rate, the, the real heat transfer divided by Q max. 177,650, from which we can now calculate the actual heat transfer rate, which is going to be 67,570 watts, or 67.5 kilowatts. So the actual heat transfer rate is only about 65, 67.5, but it can do 178.5 if I design it very well. Do you understand? Any questions? Right. Now we can go and calculate the outlet temperature of the cold stream. We've got this temperature. We actually want to calculate that outlet temperature. So that is easy. It is equal to the mass flow rate of the cold stream, the CP of the cold stream, the outlet temperature of the cold stream minus the inlet temperature of the cold stream. The heat transfer rate cannot be the maximum, it must be the real heat transfer. So it is equal to this value, 67,507, is equal to the mass flow rate of the water, it has been given as 0.5, and the CP is equal to 4179, multiplied by the outlet temperature of the cold stream minus the inlet temperature, which is 15. So that we can now calculate the outlet temperature of the cold stream as 47.3 degrees Celsius. Okay. So if we go back to our sketch here, 47.3, as we can see there's still lots of potential if we design this thing well to get the outlet temperature to be higher. Okay. The only other thing that I didn't think of asking would be the calculation of the mass flow rate of the steam. Okay, how do we calculate the mass flow rate of the steam? The mass flow rate of the steam on the hot side, okay, CP, uh, mass flow rate, multiplied by CP, multiplied by 
the inlet temperature on the hot side and the outlet temperature on the hot side. Good. It's not true. Huh? Of course, there's no temperature change. Just go back to, to this graph. Condensation occurs at a constant temperature. The CP doesn't exist. So this equation is not valid if we've got condensation, evaporation, anything like that. We have to use the equation of the mass flow rate multiplied by HFG. Okay? So, we have that. We can go and get that from our steam tables. I didn't do it, but it should be about 2,300 uh, multiplied by 10 to the 3 kilojoules. And then you can calculate the mass flow rate of the steam also. Okay, any questions? Anything that you do not understand? Is it simple? You'll be able to do it in the exam? Okay. Remember, I keep on telling you that somewhere in the test or exam, that small word, <laughs> condensation, evaporation, steam, refrigerant, is a hint. <laughs> Okay, look carefully. It means that you have something like this. <laughs> the moment you've got that, then you're lucky. You must say yes. <laughs> because the effectiveness is equal to that simple equation, and you can do all the calculations very, very easily. Okay? Right, let's do another problem. Now one that's a little bit more in terms of a reality. <laughs> And this is also a shell and tube, but a one shell pass and an eight tube pass heat exchanger. There's the shell. Okay, so there's a one shell pass and eight tube pass. <coughs> a heat exchanger. Okay. And on the shell side we have oil. The temperature of 150 degrees Celsius, the mass flow rate of the oil is equal to 0.3 kilograms per second, and uh, the CP is equal to 2.13 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. It's a one shell pass and an eight tube pass heat exchanger. And in terms of the tubes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> okay. In eight times and coming back. And on this side, we have water going in, in a temperature 20 degrees Celsius, mass flow rate 0.2 kilograms per second and a CP of 4.18 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Okay. The tube diameter is 14 millimeters. It's thin tubes. Okay. And the overall heat transfer coefficient is equal to 310 watts per meter square degree Celsius. And I think, yeah, these tubes, each one of them is 5 meters. So 5 multiplied by 840 meters of tube on the inside of the shelling tube heat exchanger. Right, while you write everything down, I'm going to clean the board on this side. <coughs> Okay, so let's look at this problem in terms of temperature as a function of x. We look at it as if it's a black box. Okay. And what we have here is an inlet temperature of 150. <coughs> okay, a hot stream. Okay. 
Here is in red, the hot stream. And then we consider the cold stream as inlet temperature of 20. And no information on condensation, evaporation, or anything like that. Okay. So that is what we have to assume. I mean, the hot stream is going to lose energy, its temperature, while the other stream, the cold stream, is going to increase in temperature. Okay. The exact paths are not important, it is just schematically. Okay, so in terms of the hot stream, CH is equal to the mass flow rate of the hot stream multiplied by the CP of the hot stream. Okay, if we look at the temperatures, we can see the oil is the hot stream and the water must be the cold stream. Okay, so the mass flow rate of the cold st hot stream is equal to 0.3 and the CP value is 2030 and that gives us a value of 639 watts per Kelvin. So it means for every 639 watts of heat transfer, the temperature would change with one degree Celsius. That is what it means. Okay. The cold stream. The cold stream is the mass flow rate of the cold stream multiplied by the CP of the cold stream. Okay, the cold stream mass flow rate is equal to 0.2. 0.2 multiplied by 4180, the CP value. And that is equal to 836 watts per Kelvin. Right, so if we look at that and this heat transfer, which stream is going to lose the most temperature? <laughs> okay. The cold one. Oh, sorry, the hot one. Sorry, uh, yeah, that one. Sorry. Okay. So before I can even put in 836, the moment there's heat transfer of 639, that stream is already going to change with one degree Celsius. Okay. Right, so now the C minimum would be equal to CH, the hot stream in this case. The hot stream is going to have the lowest value of C, the heat capacity ratio. And our small C would be equal to C minimum divided by C maximum. Okay, 639 divided by 836, and that gives us a value of 0 0.6, 0 0.764. Okay. Let's calculate the maximum possible heat transfer that this heat exchanger can do. Okay, so Q max is always equal to C minimum multiplied by the hot inlet temperature minus the cold inlet temperature. Okay. So if we look at the sketch in terms of the boundaries that are given to us, that is delta T max. If we can get these streams to operate always between those two values, then we will have the maximum possible heat transfer rate. Okay, so C minimum is equal to 639 multiplied by the inlet temperature of the hot stream is 150 minus the inlet temperature of the cold stream is 20 and that gives us a maximum heat transfer rate of 83.1 kilowatts. we're going to use it let's just calculate the surface area quickly the surface area is the number of tubes multiplied by pi d l the number of tubes is 8 pi multiplied by the diameter is 14 millimeters and the length is 5 meters every time so in total 40 and that would give us a surface area of 1.76 square meters. Okay. We are going to get it from the sketch, but the NTUs, let's calculate the NTUs quickly, equal to the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area divided by C minimum. 
the lowest one of the two. Okay, the overall heat transfer coefficient has been given as 310. The surface area we've calculated as 1.76 <coughs> divided by C minimum as 639 is equal to 0.854. So again, the NTUs tells us that this heat exchanger is not very effective. It can do much better. Okay, now we have to go and get the effectiveness of this heat exchanger. And there we go. Okay, so typically in this sketch, let me see if I can make it larger. There you go. There we see it's a one shell pass heat exchanger and two, four, six, and eight tube passes, do you see? So this is the sketch that we can use. So unfortunately, there's no condensation or evaporation, so we can't use that ratio where it is equal to zero. Okay. But the effectiveness now depends on the NTUs. We have the NTUs is equal to 0.854, and there we've got the ratio of the Cs, and our C is 0.76. So if we look at that, try to get the effectiveness as best as you can. Effectiveness is equal to 0.47. I'm sure you're telling me I'm lying. It can't be. I can't do it that well. Well, if you don't want to do that, you can calculate it from this equation here. Okay. You see? There it is. Shelling tube. One shell pass, two, four, six, and eight tube passes. Their effectiveness is equal to two plus everything in terms of C's and NTUs. Okay. So the equation is a little bit long, but if you want to get it more accurately, and obviously if you're in an environment where you're doing designs competing against others, you will have to use this equation. You won't be able to get away from it, but if you do, just go and check on the graph that you at least get about the same answer. So that you, then you know at least you didn't make a mistake in the calculation of the equation. Okay, so let's continue on this side. So, we know now the effectiveness is equal to the heat transfer rate divided by Q max. Okay. And we've just now determined the effectiveness as equal to 0.47. It's equal to the real heat transfer divided by Q max. And Q max we've calculated as 83.1 kilowatts. Therefore, we can now calculate the heat transfer rate as 39.1 kilowatts. Okay. So we can do 83 kilowatts, we're just getting out of it 39 kilowatts. Okay, about 47% effectiveness. Right, now that we have that, we can also calculate the outlet temperatures of the oil and the water. Okay, so. On the hot side, QH is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by CP, multiplied by the inlet temperature minus the outlet temperature. Okay. The transfer rate is equal to the mass flow rate CP multiplied by TH minus that, TH in minus TH out. Okay, the real heat transfer rate is 39.1 kilowatts. Okay. Okay. If we want to, we can just use that as the C value, which we have already calculated, uh, and that is equal to what, 639? Okay, multiplied by the inlet temperature, which is equal to 150 minus the outlet temperature from, from where we can calculate the outlet temperature as 88.8 degrees Celsius. 88.8. Okay, Always, ladies and gentlemen, if you do the calculation, just look at your graph. Does it make sense if you've, if you've calculated 188, you must know <laughs> something is wrong. Okay, can't be. 
Okay? Are you happy with this? Right. Now the cold side. Let's do it for the cold side. The heat transfer rate for the cold side is equal to the mass flow rate of the cold side, Cp of the cold side multiplied by the outlet temperature of the cold side minus the inlet temperature of the cold side. That is equal to C of the cold side. Okay. The heat transfer rate is 39.1 kilowatts. The CP on the cold side, this heat capacity ratio, is equal to 836 multiplied by the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. The inlet temperature was 20. Okay, so you can calculate the outlet temperature as 66.8 degrees Celsius. Okay. Let's look at our graph. 66.8, it looks fine. Okay. And what can we do now if we want to check all our calculations? What is a, what is a very simple check to go and do now? Okay. Right, so what we can do now as a check is calculate LMTD. Go and calculate your LMTD because now you have it. And then you can say that the heat transfer rate would be equal to UA multiplied by the correction factor, take note, of the LMTD. LMTD. And very importantly, we should calculate the LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. And that's exactly what we did. So this is LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. The F value, also in the graphs, you firstly you have to go and get the P and the R. Okay. So in the graphs you get the correction factor F. It's a function of P and there are different values of R. And from there you can get the correction factor. And if you now go and calculate the heat transfer rate and you get the same value, then you know You've done well. You've got it. Okay? Does that make sense? Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much. Erin, you can cut.